In this final 20th lecture on the rational biblical theology of Jonathan Edwards, we conclude, of course, with his teaching about hell and heaven. He spoke and wrote so much about these two subjects that I must confine myself here to the nature of the two abodes and to their eternality. This doctrine Edwards wrote about hell is indeed awful and dreadful, yet tis of God. In 1962, Clarence H. Faust wrote, it is true that Edwards was much more than a sensational preacher of hellfire sermons, but no fully rounded picture of the man can disregard that aspect of his work. It is evident that the present revival of interest in the Puritan sage has not denied this aspect of Edwards, but neither Faust nor the contemporary concern has done justice to Edwards' emphasis on this theme. Our age will not stand as much of hell as his own, and even it complained. Edwards wore himself out, as he had said that Stoddard had done before him. In a 1747 sermon, he laments, and indeed when I, go about, when I went about preaching this discourse, it was with considered discouragement. I thought it was now some time since I had offered any discourse of this nature, but so many had been offended with so little apparent effect that I thought with myself I know not what to say further. But however, because I must warn you from God where you will hear or whether you will forbear, I have warned you again. It has now been told once more whether you will yield to the power of God's word, to the force of the awful warnings and threatenings which the word of God sets before you or not. If you will not hear now, you may possibly solemnly lay these things to heart when you come to die. And if you continue in your stupidity to the last, being given up of God to a dreadful degree of hardness that is beyond the alarm of approaching death, which is the case with some, yet as soon as ever you are dead, you will be fully sensible of it. Consider also this lament from an earlier sermon. There Edwards reminds his people that they have been told from Sabbath to Sabbath of eternal misery, still they would not be stirred up or think about it. He continues, you'll see it amongst many middle-aged persons, and so it is still with many when advanced in years, and they certainly draw near to the grave. And yet those same persons will seem to acknowledge that the greater part of men go to hell and suffer eternal misery, and that through their carelessness about it, and yet they do the same. It was this great ever-present danger that drove Edwards to warn his generation so often, "'Tis a dreadful thing but yet a common thing for persons to go to hell. This will be among the laments of the damned, that they didn't listen. After the spiritual drought following the awakening of 1734-35, God was pleased to pour out his spirit again in 1740, Edwards observed, and then comments, if it should always have continued as it has been for five or six years, 35 to 40, almost all of you would surely have gone to hell. Still, not everyone was being converted. It is an awful thing to think that there are some persons in this very congregation, here and there, in one seat and another, that will be the subjects of that very misery that we have now heard of, as dreadful as it is, though it be so intolerable 
and though it be eternal. The closing dirge. Tell them of hell as often as you will, and set it out in as lively colors as you will, they will be slack and slothful. And I can't help but say, my friends, I hope to God you can't listen to a series of tapes on the theology of Jonathan Edwards and be slack and slothful about the peril of hell. But if he had to lament in his own time, I'm sure I will have to lament in my time that some of you hearing these tapes and being warned constantly from America's greatest preacher will persist in your slothful way to that terrible and dreadful end that you know so much about but pay no attention to. Hell. I might say at this point something I was reflecting upon, especially as I thought about this final lesson on the nature and eternality of hell, especially. These two statements here, just to sort of accentuate in this final lecture what Jonathan Edwards means to me and what I think he ought to mean to you. This is Matthew 25, 46, the statement of none other than the incarnate Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. These will go away to eternal punishment. I've often said from the pulpit, if there was no other text in the entire Bible than Matthew 25, 46, that would demonstrate beyond debate that the Bible teaches the doctrine of eternal hell from the lips of the Son of God himself. Now, in the light of that verity, how can you or I be impressed that a mere servant of Jesus Christ said, as sure as God is true, there will be absolutely no end to the misery of hell. Can this add anything to that? Edwards would be horrified at the mere question. Of course it couldn't. This is the word of God, the indisputable truth of the deity. Why then are we impressed by this? I'll answer it in terms of myself. I know the Bible, and I know what Jesus has said, and I know this is the truth, and I believe it. As I say, if no one else had ever said anything but that, for Jesus Christ to have said that would have settled that in my mind forever without dispute. What this means to me is this. Here is one of the finest theologians the church has ever had who has given his whole life of genius to the study of the Word of God, fully conversant with the various arguments about hell and protests against it, and twisting of Scripture in a way that seems somehow or other to justify annihilation, coming up with this verdict. As sure as God is true, there will be absolutely no end to the misery of hell. This adds nothing to that. But what it does show me is that about all the dispute and debate that has concerned the Bible and concerned the teaching of Jesus Christ, this remarkably fine student of the Word, paying full attention to the arguments and dealing with them, with them in radical thoroughness, is able to say with this kind of confidence that these are the words of Jesus Christ and these are the words of God. And this is the absolute truth that those who are rejected by God are going to go into eternal punishment. Edwards ranging over the whole Bible, fully conversant with the debates of the centuries about it, especially the deists, is prepared to say, after a lifetime of diligent polemical study on the subject, as sure as God is true, there will be absolutely no end to the misery of hell. That's the sobering significance of a man like Jonathan Edwards. And I think perhaps that sentence 
is as sobering a statement as Jonathan Edwards ever made. As sure as God is true, there will be absolutely no end to the misery of hell. Surely that is beyond comparison the most awesome concept that ever can enter the human mind. Eternal misery. But if you're going to try to deny it, you're going to have to deny God or his veracity. Says Edwards, echoing the words of the Son of God, these will go away to eternal punishment. If I had time, I don't think I could still yield to the absurdity of the argument that a modern scholar actually exhibits when he tries to show that those words of Jesus Christ actually argue annihilation. I won't insult your intelligence. I don't think I'd do it even if I had the time to do it. But nevertheless, it's a prevalent doctrine among evangelicals at the end of the 20th century. And one of them once said, how can I worship a God who's immune to pain? And he thought a God who would send sinners whom he wanted to be saved to hell would have to undergo eternal pain if indeed he would eternally punish the wicked. Jonathan Edwards knew better. God was pleased with all his work, and though he had no pleasure in the death of the wicked, he had great pleasure in the exhibition of his justice, his righteousness, his holiness, and his power. So that he can be said, as Edward said, very lucidly, emphatically, and yet with tears in his heart, God is pleased with the damnation of the wicked, not because of their suffering, but because of the righteousness and holiness of it. And so must the saints of God actually be. In spite of the fact that Edwards is most famous for his teaching about the doctrine of hell, and without question, sinners in the hands of an angry God is the best known sermon ever preached in these United States. He had far more absorption with the glories of heaven. And that was the theme which really tuned his heart to sing God's praise most frequently and most joyously, though, as I have said, he glorified God. Justice, holiness, wrath in the damnation of sinners as well. Heaven, says Edwards, is the place of unmixed and unending happiness as incapable of exaggeration as are the miseries of the damned. I didn't mention that, but Edwards is often accused of exaggerating the horrors of hell. And Edwards just says in a matter of fact rationality, how is it possible to exaggerate the wrath of God? Who can know the power of his anger? But now he's saying with equal truth and fervor that it's impossible to exaggerate the blessings of heaven because they are the blessings of God. They're scarce anything that can be conceived or expressed about the degrees of happiness of the saints in heaven. The intimacy is based on the incarnation which admits man, quote, to the inmost fellowship with the deity. It seems, Edwards continues, to be God's design to admit the church into the divine family as his son's wife. The atonement is a supreme bond of intimacy for, quote, Christ will surely give himself as much to his saints as he has given himself for them. He whose arms were open to suffer, to be nailed to the cross, will doubtless be opened as wide to embrace those for whom he suffered. Edwards had laid the foundation for a definition of heaven in one of his earliest miscellanies, written when he was about 20 years of age. Contrary to the opinion of Hobbes, he says, 
Not matter is substance, but only God who is spirit is substance. Other spirits also are substantial, but matter is no substance at all. Consequently, it followed in all his preaching that heaven, where the saints enjoy God as their portion, is the place of real, substantial happiness. You realize that Hobbes was the great materialist. And Edwards is saying, material isn't real. The only thing that's real is the ideal. And that which you dismiss, Hobbes, as if it didn't exist, that's the only thing that really does exist. And that's where it will exist in the quintessence of its excellence, in heaven. So the heaven you can't even conceive of is the only true substance, and it's substantially happy in the very substance of God. Sometimes heaven seems even super substantial. Thus they shall eat and drink abundantly and swim in the ocean of love and be eternally swallowed up in the infinitely bright and infinitely mild and sweet beams of divine love, eternally receiving that light, eternally full of it, and eternally compassed round with it, and everlastingly reflecting it back again to its fountain. This is a description of Brainerd's present heaven, basing an address on the fact that the revelation metaphor of transparent gold speaks of something beyond reality or imagination, Edwards nevertheless gives us eight figures of this truth before pointing out the insufficiency of all of them and then lines up seven arguments from reason and seven more from Scripture for the truth of this transcendental truth. This was the funeral sermon for David Brainerd as he's describing the heaven in which he believed David Brainerd already was, whereupon he considers four respects in which this truth is unknown and ends with an extensive and searching application. We'll settle for the doctrine taken from Revelation 21:18. quote, there is nothing upon earth that will suffice to represent to us the glory of heaven. Transparent gold, you see, is the term used in the book of Revelation. We don't know what transparent gold is. And Edwards is saying, Scripture uses that to inform us that we don't have anything on earth that would do justice to describe the glories of heaven. Interestingly, teenage Edwards had written in his very first extent extant sermon, that on Isaiah 3.10, that to pretend to describe, now this is 17-year-old Jonathan Edwards preaching his very first sermon on Isaiah 3.10, to pretend to describe the excellence, the greatness, or duration of the happiness of heaven by the most artful composition of words would be but to darken and cloud it, to talk of raptures, and ecstasies, joy, and singing is but to set forth very low shadows of the reality. And all we can say by our best rhetoric is really and truly vastly below what is but the bare and naked truth. And if St. Paul, who had seen them, thought it but in vain to endeavor to utter it, much less shall we pretend to do it, and the scriptures have gone as high in the description of it as we are able to keep pace with in our imaginations and conception. Thus, 17-year-old Jonathan Edwards, in his very first sermonic effort, tried and admitted he failed miserably in describing the glories of heaven. Another of the means of grace, the Lord's Supper, is given here below as a foretaste of the ineffably sublime heavenly communion. I've had to skip the material on the sacraments as taught by Edwards, which were quite interesting, and I recommend you to read them at your leisure. But 
he does see the sacrament of the Lord's Supper especially as a foretaste of the glory of God in heaven. Much of the perfect happiness of heaven is the fellowship of the saints there. It is sweet here, but perfect there. Anticipated here, fulfilled there. They, he says, shall have great delight in the society and enjoyment of one another. The saints in heaven shall all be one society. They shall be united together without any schism. There shall be sweet harmony and a perfect unity. And though I don't think I have mentioned that, Edwards had a grand anticipation of that in his own family. Eight daughters and three sons, a very lovely union with Sarah, his wife. They had a little heaven in their family in Northampton and Stockbridge as the children themselves bear witness. Little Pierpont, the last one, went astray but it's partly because his mother and father died when he was still very young and never had the benefit of an Edwardsian rearing. But all the other children gave evidence of having been born again and through their lineage have bequeathed a very great heritage for the United States of America. A special pleasure or peculiar comfort, as he calls it, of the communion of saints in heaven is that they will recognize their former Christian friends from earth. It is true that in our present condition, natural affection is a duty, and the absence of it is a sign of a very vicious disposition. But natural affection is no virtue in the saints in glory. Nevertheless, there is no reason to think, he writes, that the friendship contracted here on earth between saints will be rooted out in another world. So saints will recognize fellow saints in heaven, and the love for them will be perfected. This is wonderful for friends, but what about enemies? Disputes also will be settled at the day of judgment, as some parties are vindicated and rewarded with heaven, while others are condemned and punished. That was the thrust of his farewell message in July of 1750 after he had been solemnly rejected by his congregation. This was a poignant anticipation which Edwards expressed. How highly, therefore, he said, does it now become us to consider of that time when we must meet together again before the chief shepherd, when I must give an account of my stewardship of the services I have done and the reception and treatment I have had among the people to whom he sent me. And you, he says to his people, you must give an account of your own conduct toward me and the improvement you have made of these three and twenty years of my ministry. And I may add that the man who led the forces of opposition to Thomas to Jonathan Edwards later repented deeply, published his recantation in the newspaper, wrote to Jonathan Edwards asking for his forgiveness and indicating the fact that he lived in dread, that he had caused one of God's little ones to stumble and that it would better for him if he had millstone town around his neck and he was drowned in the depth of the sea. Edwards forgave him, and we hope God forgave him, though he expressed a deep doubt that God would ever forgive the perfidy of the crime he had committed against his spiritual father, Jonathan Edwards. At that time, Edwards says he will declare what is right between them, him and his estranged congregation, approving him that has been just and faithful and condemning the unjust and perfect truth and equity shall take place in the sentence which he passes, in the rewards he bestows, and the punishment which he inflicts. Most everybody who has read this farewell sermon of Jonathan Edwards to his congregation in Northampton admit it admit that it's a remarkable study in objectivity. And he's almost as detached from the, form, from the later scene of judgment that will take place 
as if he were uninvolved in the episode. And he just presented it to his people as an estrangement and difference between us and the judge of heaven and earth will decide who was right and who was wrong and what our motives were and will set everything aside. And no one who had opposed him or defended him could have had the slightest objection to that farewell address, though they said had such a hostility to the one they had dismissed that later on when he waited to have invitations to supply pulpits until he actually was called to another one he could success. They hated him so much that they would go without a service rather than have Jonathan Edwards occupy their pulpit. But even later when he wrote back to the people his lingering affection for them and love for them and concern especially for those who were seeking was very, very evident that he believed in the eternality of heaven as confidently as the eternality of hell. There is no doubt at all. And he, one of his choice remarks is that the heavenly inhabitants remain in eternal youth. He also indicates that it's natural for them, even though perfect, to grow in perfection. And on the whole, as you read his various writings about the heaven with God, every bit as arousing and awakening and quickening as anything that he warns against by the terrors of hell. Let us close this little series on the rational biblical theology of Jonathan Edwards with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the gift to us of Jonathan Edwards. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Surely next to the gift of thy dear son himself, none is so precious as those who have ably and faithfully taught us about thy son. When Jesus Christ rose from the grave and ascended into heaven triumphant in glory, he gave gifts to the church for whom he had shed his own blood. Some were apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to train us up into the fullness of the image of Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Surely Jonathan Edwards served his own day and generation in New England Surely he now serves the whole world by his sagacity and wisdom in the ways of nature and in the ways of nature's God. He has, as Jeremiah prayed, fed thy people with understanding. He has built up thy people in the most holy faith. He has millions of souls for his hire. Surely he is very close to thy throne, and many of us are on the narrow way to eternal life because of his faithful guidance. We pray for a perishing world that may be awakened before flames overtake them by the preaching of Jonathan Edwards. We pray for those who have been awakened to their peril and their possibility of eternal salvation, that they may seek and find. We pray for those who found him, whom to know is life eternal, many of them through the long dead servant who speaks ever louder and louder as the great day he so eagerly anticipated draws nigh. We all thank thee that we are the better able to love and serve thee because of the ministry of Jonathan Edwards. May we be used in our day and generation to turn many from iniquity, to follow in paths of righteousness for thy name's sake. In Jesus Christ our Lord, amen and amen.